Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Power Chord Productions and Podcastings. I am your host, Jerron Harrington, back here to another video. And today, we are going to be concluding our What If Dr. Octopus from Spider-Man 2 Became the Superior Spider-Man, The Superior Saga, Part 2. As always, if you're a fan of today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that's to come out now and in the future. With this series, we are exploring a different what if in a Marvel multiverse. Looking into the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, our story started at the tail end of Spider-Man 2 where instead of leaving Dr. Otto Octavius, aka Dr. Octopus, to destroy the machine that he had created by himself, resulting in his death, Peter Parker, the Tobey Maguire version, instead went back to assist him. However, in doing so, it caused a chain of reactions with the machine itself, resulting with the two of them switching bodies and consciousness, with now Dr. Otto Octavius in the body of Spider-Man. Now being given a second chance and a new lease on life, Otto would set out to do good for the world, not only just for those in need, but also to prove something to himself. Never wanting to be one that was inferior, Otto set out to prove that he could not only be the best Spider-Man, but the superior one as well. In part 1, we followed his journey, as he attempted to help his good friend Dr. Kurt Connors in restoring his arm. However, in a science experiment gone wrong, it resulted in the creation of the lizard. To make matters worse, his friend, Parker's friend, Harry Osborn, now seeking vengeance for the death of his father, has set out to kill Spider-Man himself. However, this Spider-Man is now inhabited by a new body. But even still, there are feelings that harbor within the old consciousness feelings that Otto is now experiencing. As we continue into part 2, we'll see how he balances these new emotions. Will he be able to hold himself together in the face of new and ever-growing threats? Find out as we now continue. What if Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2 became Superior Spider-Man? As always, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Otto avoided an attack from the Hobgoblin as he tore off his suit to reveal his Spider-Man costume underneath. His four mechanical limbs also appearing from his back as Spider-Man and the Hobgoblin engaged in combat. The fight would be similar to the original timeline, albeit with some minor changes. For one, Harry's suit was different from that of Spider-Man 3, his suit actually being a silver version of the Green Goblin suit, also a custom with an orange hoodie and an orange cloak, revealing that of the true Hobgoblin of this universe, along with his dark silver glider that he rode in the combat. The two of them would fight amongst the skyline of New York. However, despite Harry's upgrade in technology, Peter, having had time to work via with the mind of Otto, of course, that occupied his body, Spider-Man would make better use of his abilities than he did in the original timeline. Unlike in the original fight, where Spider-Man was holding back for Harry's sake, with Otto now in control, while he felt sympathy for Harry and his situation, it didn't compromise that Harry was a threat that needed to be taken down. The fight would make its way to the high buildings of New York as it had once before. 
the two fighting across the narrow gaps. Harry attempting to use multiple pumpkin bombs and bat bombs, hoping to eliminate Spider-Man. However, in the midst of battle, Harry's helmet would be taken off from his head, and he would find himself being hit by a metal pole, causing him to crash down to the ground below, knocking him completely unconscious. Peter would stay by Harry's side, looking to try to get him first aid as soon as possible. In the process, because this version of Peter had been taken over by Otto Octavius, and Otto wanting to do right by Peter's legacy and not be involved with MJ, MJ would have married the son of J. Jonah Jameson and would have moved on with her life no longer living in New York as her husband was now a world famed astronaut, the two would relocate to a different area. As such, Pierre and MJ would not be together in the park when the meteorite with the symbiote landed to Earth, meaning the symbiote would crawl and hide in the shadows as it searched for a new host. In the meantime, Flint Marco would still escape from prison as he had once before, reconvening and meeting with his sick daughter before setting off to get money for her treatments by any means necessary. Peter would focus on helping Harry recover in the hospital. Once Harry was discharged, it would be revealed that Harry was now suffering from amnesia just as he had in the original story. Peter would want to work on helping Harry develop new memories while having amnesia hoping that he would forget about his life as the Hobgoblin and hopefully to spare them from any further unnecessary battles. Peter would continue on serving as the superior Spider-Man via Otto. With this, Spider-Man from the original timeline till now would have been a lot less lenient when it came to criminals. Not that he would go around outright killing them or anything like that, but simply being that the jokes and the quick whips would often be less and more often than not the physicality would take a bit of an increase. Spider-Man becoming a bit more methodical in the way that he carried himself. Even the Daily Bugle would have to change its stance on Spider-Man as J. Jonah Jameson was even able to take note of just how much of a new attitude Spider-Man had taken. No nonsense and straight to the point. Thankfully, their new photographer, Eddie Brock, wouldn't have to worry about dealing with Peter or potentially trying to steal his spot. Because of this, Eddie would become the new prime photographer of Spider-Man, although his shots wouldn't be nearly as good since he wouldn't be able to get the best pics of Spider-Man in action, mainly because the best pics came from Peter, who were taking them of himself. Peter, however, would continue on in other aspects, this being Otto, of course. One aspect of his life that would change would be his newfound fortune. With the institution of Parker Industries, Peter was now starting to see more wealth in his life than he could have possibly have imagined. Also, his relationship with Felicia Hardy was also taking an increase as well as the two of them were developing feelings and were getting much closer to one another. The city would also be thriving as well, so much so to the point that crime had taken a massive dip. Peter had also worked on getting Aunt May to move somewhere where she could be a bit more safer and secure, moving her to a specific neighborhood where Peter could be the closest to her at all times, as well as having his spider legion, his small robotic spiders, watching over New York from the shadows, and making sure that everyone was safe. Spider-Man would still go on to save Gwen Stacy from the falling building, just as he had in the original timeline, this being the daughter of the police commissioner, Captain Stacy. In the process of this, he would also accept the key to the city, where the citizens would celebrate his hard work, naming the day as Spider-Man Day. However, in the midst of the celebration, Spider-Man's drones will alert him to a bank robbery in progress. This would lead to the first fight between Spider-Man and the Sandman, as Flint Marco would still go on to gain his powers by falling in the Hydro Collider while attempting to escape the authorities. 
The fight would be a bit different from before, even with the surprise of Sandman's sand-like abilities. With Otto being able to think quickly and on his feet, he would actually be able to match and counter the Sandman to a degree of sorts. Not enough to get the full out win, but at the same time, he would be able to hold his own much better. Now with Sandman realizing he would have to take Spider-Man much more seriously in the future, as he hadn't been able to get enough money to be able to help pay for his daughter's treatment. In the meantime, Peter would still continue to spend time with Harry, helping his friend recover from his amnesia as he rested. Also, the symbiote would find itself moving through New York, before ultimately attaching itself to a prison bus that was transporting various criminals, among them being the murderer Cletus Cassidy, who had been sentenced to life in prison following his massive killing spree, although he was ultimately foiled by Spider-Man. Cassidy, a deranged psychopath from birth, was seeking revenge, and this night, his birth of his new persona would take fold. In the midst of the rain, the symbiote would crawl through the various cracks and crevices of the bus before eventually landing on Cassidy. The symbiote would adopt a similar personality to that of its host itself, changing in color from black to a deep blood red. Cletus would morph into Carnage for the first time, feeling the power overwhelm him as the two would bond and join together. They would slaughter everyone on the bus before eventually escaping to freedom, and now with his newfound power, Cassie would make his way back to New York, not only to resume his killing, but also to seek revenge against the wall crawler. Not too long after, Peter along with Aunt May would learn that Flint Marco was the one responsible for the death of Uncle Ben. Even while Otto was in control of Peter's body, Peter's previous emotions as well as his former memories would still be a part of him along with his own. This would overwhelm him feeling a strong sense of murderous rage and anger on behalf of Peter. As such, Spider-Man would then set out to hunt down the Sandman and destroy him. This leading to their second fight within the sewers, where Spider-Man would be even more deranged than before. Even without the symbiote, his anger would be more than enough as he sentenced Sandman to his wiry grave, before eventually destroying him and sending him down into the waters below believing that that would have potentially have been the end for him. All the while, Harry would slowly regain his memories, the illusions of the goblin formula eventually taking over, to the point where he moved to exact revenge against Peter. Unlike in the original timeline, with no MJ here, attacking Peter's heart would be a bit more difficult, however not too much. Taking a playbook out of his father's own ways of dastardly torture, Harry would decide on attacking Peter in another way. As Peter would have arrived to Aunt May's home to visit her, he would be surprised to learn that Harry was already there as well. As the three had dinner, Harry with subtle innuendos would reveal that he was now back in his full state of consciousness and he remembered everything very clearly. As Aunt May would go to sleep, Peter and Harry would make their way outside before going into an alleyway, where Harry made it very clear that he knew everything that was going on. He would threaten Peter to stop being Spider-Man, to give up Parker Industries and to leave New York and never return. Otherwise, Aunt May may face an unexpected accident like she had before. Hearing these words would only piss him off and enrage him even further. The two, even without their hero costumes at the moment, would engage in a one-on-one -on -one brawl, still having the superior strength and with the organic webbing at his disposal. Peter would begin to beat down Harry mercilessly. Harry, although wearing a few weapons on him at the time, the two of them fighting farther and farther within the alleyway, before long Peter would eventually gain the upper hand as Harry attempted to stop him once more, before Peter would catch the spare pumpkin bomb that had been thrown at him 
before throwing it back at Harry and having it blow up in his face. As Pierce stood over Harry, Harry would ask if he was going to kill him the same way he had killed his father. However, now with Otto in control and losing his mind, he would give an even harsher reply to Harry, not one of insult but one of pure anger, asking if he was really that delusional. His father was the notorious Green Goblin, a villain who plagued the city, who tried to kill MJ, who tried to kill Aunt May, who had even tried to kill him amongst many others. But if he was still that foolish enough to follow in his father's footsteps, then he was going to face the consequence. And it wasn't going to be like his father, who had foolishly tried to take his life only to lose his own. But that Peter took the safety of the city and the people that lived in it as top priority above anything else. As Harry looked deep into Peter's eyes, he almost felt as though he weren't looking at the same person anymore. And in essence, he wasn't. Via Peter, Otto would make it very clear. If Harry did anything to anyone and he was aware about it, he would treat Harry like a true hostile and he would put an end to him once and for all, regardless of their friendship. That being the only thing that was keeping him alive to begin with, despite his various threats. In the meanwhile, Sandman's daughter's own condition was getting worse and worse by the minute, it getting to the point where the situation was becoming more dire and no longer could he afford to waste any time. Even his ex-wife, who was against his criminal activity, was so desperate that she asked for him to do whatever he could to save their daughter's life. Sandman knowing this would make his way to a bank where he knew he could find enough money that was needed to cover the expense for his daughter's operation. While his daughter was being rushed to the hospital, Sandman was going to take the money and drop it off in an area where his wife could get it, and from there he would simply face the consequences of whatever was going to happen. In the process, Spider-Man would end up being alert to his location, where the two of them would have their third encounter. Being prepared this time, Spider-Man would have created a few different type of elemental grenades to use to stun Sandman and keep him in place. That being flaming grenades that would crystallize over the sand or ice grenades that would freeze him in place. Using them sparingly and at the right moments, Sandman would be broken apart into pieces and forced on the defensive. As Spider-Man and Sandman continued in their fighting, Sandman only asked that Spider-Man would give him the time that he needed to save his daughter's life, as the pendant that he carried of her would fall to the ground. Seeing this, Sandman would ask why Spider-Man had such a vendetta against him, before eventually taking off his mask and revealing himself, stating that the old man that he had killed in Mr. Ben Parker was his uncle and someone that meant the world to him. Realizing this, Sandman would apologize for what he had done, as he didn't mean to cause him any sort of pain. He knew that what he had done was wrong, and if he could take it back he would, but he was only trying to get money for his daughter's operation, and he needed the car. Things got out of control, and unfortunately it resulted in his death. Hearing this, Spider-Man would take a moment to calm down, Knowing now his intentions, while he could still never forgive them, at the very least he understood, and now wanting to try to do things right, instead of giving into his hatred or giving into revenge, he would try to form some form of sympathy. In the midst of their heart to heart, an alert would go off to Spider-Man, letting him know that a nearby hospital was now being under siege by a strange creature one in red that was going about killing the various guards as well as a few doctors and other patients. Learning that the hospital was where Sandman's daughter was also, Spider-Man and Sandman would quit their battle as they made their way to the hospital where the doors on the bottom floors had been locked with webbing, a strange new substance that wasn't Spider-Man's. 
Spider-Man arriving on the scene would learn from the police that someone was going inside on a killing spree, and that recently, the murderous Cleus Cassidy had also been freed from his transport to prison. Now knowing that Cassidy was somehow involved in this, Spider-Man, along with Sandman, would both make their way into the building, as they looked to save as many as they could on the various floors, as Cassidy went stalking his victims. He would ultimately find himself at the room of Sandman's daughter, with Spider-Man and Sandman arriving just in time removing him away, as Sandman's ex-wife and his daughter were huddled up hiding away from the monster serial killer. Spider-Man and Sandman would engage with Carnage in battle. This version of Carnage would be very formidable, mainly due to the strength of the symbiote, being able to hold his own against Sandman, as well as fight against Spider-Man, their strength being almost equal, Spider-Man now having a bit more of a difficult time as the two of them were separated. Cassidy would now turn his attentions towards Spider-Man, as he was the one who had sent him away in the first place. In the meantime, Harry would still go on to learn from his butler of the truth of his father's death. Now being filled with regret and wanting to make things right with Peter, learning of the situation taking place, he would ditch his hobgoblin uniform for the one that he used as the new goblin as he joined Spider-Man and Sandman in the fight. Within the midst of the hospital, Spider-Man and Sandman would both attempt to hold off Carnage the best they could, until eventually Harry would arrive bursting through the window and tackling Carnage with his glider knocking him to the ground. As the newly formed Carnage would rise with his symbiote once again, the three now unlikeliest of heroes would join together to battle against the Red Menace. Carnage using his various tendrils to try to pierce and hold them in place so that he could stab them with his various symbiote weapons from his symbiotic axe as well as his piercing spikes. Sandman would attempt to use his sand to cover multiple areas, trying to bind and hold Carnage at once, until eventually the two of them became a mesh of symbiote and sand, both entangled and neither one able to pull away from the other. Sandman realized that the only way for them to get victory was to destroy the two of them here and now. He only asked that Spider-Man would watch after his daughter and help her. Both Spider-Man and Harry would promise that they would watch after his daughter. And with that, Sandman would tell them to do whatever they could to destroy the both of them once and for all. Spider-Man taking out his flaming grenades as well as Harry with every pumpkin bomb at his disposal, they would launch the payload at the two of them as it merged in the amalgamation of symbiote as well as sand, as they would be thrown out of the building high enough so that they would be away from causing any damage as a large explosion would shoot off in the air, destroying and killing the both of them. In the midst of the destruction around them, Harry would apologize to Peter for everything, promising to change his ways and to try to rekindle the friendship that they had lost. They knew that it might be difficult for some time, but there were old wounds that could be healed. In the aftermath of the battle, both Harry and Peter would find something amongst the rubble, an egg-like substance of sorts, that Peter theorized contained a new symbiote. They would make their way to Parker Industries, where they would lock it in a capsule, waiting to see what would happen. From inside, a small black symbiote would form. From the readings they were able to gather, the symbiote was not connected to Carnage. It was more so of an offspring than anything else, but one that hadn't been imprinted on. Because of that, it could become anything essentially. Harry would ask if he could use the symbiote believing that he could do more with it in his own way. Peter would agree, but only under the condition that Harry be cured, not wanting to have any of the goblin's influence within him play a role in influencing the symbiote. Harry would agree to this and would soon be cured himself, removing the aggressive tendencies of the symbiote from his body, 
clearing his mind and giving him a good mental state as well as physical. As a result, Harry would bond with the symbiote that would actually take on a life of its own. It would be a bit primitive as it was new and recently born, but it didn't share the same murderous tendencies as his father and went by another name, that being Venom. Harry would destroy all of the goblin tech, removing it, not wanting to have anything to do with its tainted legacy. And instead, Peter and Harry would look to take their companies into new and different heights, as both Oscorp as well as Parker Industries would join together to serve for a brighter future for their world. Harry adopting a similar moniker and style to Peter, the Spider-Man, the two of them would join together in protecting their city as they became the web-slinging duo of Spider-Man and Venom. A short while after, on one fateful evening, as Peter was getting ready to leave his office and head home in preparation for another date that he had with Felicia Hardy, an instant phenomenon would occur. A portal would open before him as a man would step out dressed in a black and blue suit with the number four emblazoned on his chest. Peter would stand at the ready, unsure of who this new foe was. However, the man would reveal that he came in peace, giving his name as Reed Richards, a leading member of the Fantastic Four. However, Peter had never heard of the Fantastic Four via Otto, as the Fantastic Four did not exist in this universe. However, Reed explained that he was from a different reality, and that the reason he had come was because there was a growing threat in the multiverse, and that many great heroes from various dimensions were being gathered together to fight this impending new force. While not fully understanding everything that was involved, he wasn't new to the idea of multiversal time travel or anything along those lines. But all the same, to hear that such a threat was coming and could potentially harm his world and the people in it, Peter looked on with determination, knowing that the date might have to wait for a bit. As he donned his superior Spider-Man uniform, he would tell Harry that he was going to have to leave for some time and that he would have to watch after the city in his stead. As the two of them made their way to the portal, Peter would ask what was the name of this new team that was being assembled, and why they required the need for help from the superior Spider-Man. Reed would simply turn back to him as he said, They were the Illuminati. This concludes, What If Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2 Became the Superior Spider-Man Part 2. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcasting that has to come out now and in the future. Also, check out some of our other content on the channel as well as we tell stories of all kind and of every shape and variety. And if you have any suggestions yourself, don't forget to leave them down in the comment section below. But anyway, this is Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.